the first chapter. Men have fear and reservations. Men have honor. Men have sensibilities. Look into my eyes. Do you see a man in there? The great white. Among them, mostly the young, were the parents of humans who had never seen the sun that had nursed their civilization into existence. The descendants of the sun worshippers were still in shock at how thoroughly they had been beaten. First contact with the crew of the Yolopal had been hopeful. It emboldened one's sense of self to see creatures that came from across the universe that owned similar faces. But when those familiar faces spoke perfect English, Chinese, and Latin, a cloud of suspicion touched down and spread fear and hysteria throughout yet another Earth. Relations had broken down quickly when it was explained exactly what these intruders wanted. For every man, woman, and child to take refuge inside a vessel they insisted upon calling an ark. The reason given for this exodus was thoroughly chuckled at by Earth's scientific and skeptic community. How could the universe be shrinking so fast that it threatened the present generation? But the executive officer of the Yola Pilot explained at length the situation that was upon them and even provided video footage. All while the Yola Pilot's captain slumped in unrestrained boredom. And this is what they disagreed on. The universe was not shrinking, but being consumed by an unseen force. Some believed and rushed to be taken on board the alien ship. Others wanted to get away from Earth to escape whatever life they had ruined there and start anew. But as always, no Earth would part with her children so easily, and a short and ugly war followed. The combined strength of Earth, now threatened by the alien menace, rose up only to be thwarted by a seemingly impossible number of troops. Faceless soldiers all cut to similar dimensions, wielding only black blades. In only a few hours the assault was complete and there were still billions left to be herded on board the alien ships beneath the muddy sky. Many would never doubt, even hundreds of years after, that the absurd war was by design to soften them up for life in captivity, to make them fear the black blade so that only the strongest and most fearless among the humans would dare to rise against the one that had condemned them. All over this cratered and ashen planet were portals which led into the starship Yolopile. So large, its navigation officer would not risk maneuver through such a tightly packed galaxy as the Milky Way. Instead, smaller ships, by comparison, had dropped the troops used in the assault, and similar ships were used to recover the refugees, their own portals leading to their quarantine decks. The process the Yolopile crew used to divide the humans by class and station was not lost on the humans, especially those that benefited from the division. Colonialism, it seemed, to be a natural evil, like slavery and war. It was an event that a nation worked through and had never passed over by foresight or moral courage, not even the Yolopile. The captain of this vessel, Lord Antono Elias Meehan II, had led his forces across the reaches of space to bring exoneration from the punishment handed down from the fates. For what transgression exactly, it was doubtful anyone could say. Against their will, these humans were rescued from a horror no one would understand until thousands of years into their future. If anyone survived the calamity, soldiers and paramedics gave as many explanations as they were allowed, but many civilians were still in shock from the attack. Only hours after Earth fell, Refugees were then told their very existence was collapsing and their planet would be consumed by the Yolopile for fuel and building materials. With the loss of so much already, many shrugged at the soldiers' stories. For what would they gain from the lie? And even if it were the truth, why would it matter now? Earth was dead without all of her children and animals to populate her. They knew any of the strange accented words which came from behind their shiny black faceplates had been passed down from a person they would never meet, a man the soldiers referred to as Deicide. From a great distance, Deicide appeared as any other human. Only in close vicinity would one notice that his large lips barely held back several sets of edged teeth, and that his dark brown skin was covered in ancient war wounds, many on his face and neck. 
His nose was long and wide, as if the corner of a lost pyramid had been grafted to his face. Above it were two sad eyes that sparkled like colorless jewels. At the front of his close-cropped hair were two long hair-like antennas, each tipped with a tiny red bulb which gave off a faint illumination. Even in daylight, they seemed to react to the bodies moving around him, independent of his gaze. Deicide strode between the seeming endless columns of people filling into the portals ahead. He nodded to his soldiers, keeping watch over their new guests. They saluted Deicide by placing their right fist to where their lips would be behind the masks, a gesture stating that their fists were his fists, that his strength was theirs. The black faceplates of the soldiers reflected the tired faces of the masses. Deicide seemed unconcerned with the numbers of refugees, for he knew they were beaten. No leader could rouse the fighting spirit of this many disheartened people. He knew trouble would come soon, but not until the first generation of rebels had been born on the inside, after they had been emboldened by the fanciful stories told by their parents and grandparents as bedtime fairy tales. It was always the wonderment of the sun that did it. Humans did love their fire, he thought, chuckling to himself. However, his lips tightened and his forehead creased when he thought back on why anyone would worship anything, especially the sun. Had not his existence showed them that all things were inevitably mortal, people forget, but they will be reminded. Deicide ceased his advance when a strange group met his gaze. Their heads were not bowed, and they did not look away when the noble approached. They looked as though they were fighting the urge to spit on him, and Deicide's humanoid appearance could only frame this event as a grotesque betrayal. But Deicide was not from Earth, and many historians would argue whether he was human at all. He and his wife were the last of a people known as the Obstrusions, a civilization that strived for the evolution and immortality of their species above any goal. Their work now involved collecting species with genetic similarities to their own, so they could begin to fill out their ranks once more. It was humans and their numerous mutations that happened to be their closest genetic relatives. At the same time, the deicide admired the passion and ingenuity that humans possessed. He despised their rationality, their jealousy and greed. He was sure that if he did die, if such a thing was even possible, the humans would start a war over who would get to carry his head on a pike. Deicide continued his walk, looking upon the shuffling masses with listless eyes. He had seen the faces countless times before, even in sleep he could not escape them, always desperate and pleading. Yet he could no longer be moved to care for the civilians if their basic needs had been met. They were the meat of the squalid floods which populated the districts that would power his starship. Comparatively, only a few had access to break free from their desolated station. Just outside of their rat wheels was Yolapau's citizenship, a chance to live a long and productive life. For someone to move through the class system, they would need to be not only special, but useful as well. Beautiful girls, fools, and ruffians had their places. But as always, those who had ears thirsty for knowledge, or hands that remained clean despite their exposure to filthy unspoken deeds, were coveted in the courts of the powerful, as they had been since the beginning of civilization. As Deicide continued to pass among the queues, a woman broke from the line and dropped down before him, groveling at his feet. He sighed as she recovered something from the queue and passed him a crying infant. He took a moment to look over the child wrapped in the grey bundle. Even if it was misshapen or deformed, the Yolipau possessed technology that could cure it. But Deicide would not accept just any child into his legion. He let his hair-like antennas dangle beside the child's face to mesmerize him and stared hard into his eyes. As his mind worked, the lights on the tip of his antennas began to flicker. Children, through their innocence, possessed none of the barriers that adults acquired through the trials of life, and their brain's network was open to all who knew how to navigate it. Once a soldier had asked him what he was searching for in the children, the deicide had jokingly replied, some resemblance. In truth, this was exactly what he was searching for a similar-tempered child that could be trained as a military officer, politician, or spy. Kept close, he could use the child to gauge the temperature of the districts, which were nests of terrorists and rebels, prodding and goading them into a froth when required. 
making brutal suppression or outright war a necessity. As his wife not had always told him, strife means progress. <laughs>